maybe dance around a little bit. We hope you join with us. Let's sing this up.
seat brush. You're doing it. Say hi to two people around you. Say hi say good and to them. move the safety seat. If you're watching online, we are so happy you are here. Make sure you're checking in, letting us know where you're watching from. Yes. Take a deep breath. <laughs> My name is Abby Beachy. I have enjoyed this morning so oh, far, absolutely. and I'm a little out of breath, but I'm on staff here, and I'm so glad you guys are here this morning. Yes, and my name is Danielle Kelly. I had the privilege of being married to our pastor, Trey Kelly. We are so excited that you are here with us today, and we always like to take a second in our service just to say a special welcome to you if it is your very first Sunday with us. We are so glad that you decided to join us today, and we can't wait to see what God's going to do in your life over the next few minutes, and we would absolutely love the chance to get to know you a little bit better, and there's a couple of ways we do that here at Wells spring what is this connection card you're going to find this in the seat back of the chair in front of you if you don't mind take a second and fill this out and hang on to it i would love for you to bring this to the blue room it's a room just off our lobby here immediately following this service we're hosting an after party for you we have a gift for you we'd love to shake your hand get to know you a little better and thank you again so much for being here today i promise it's going to be the best hour of your week Yes, and I hope it has already been off to a great start. And if you are a guest, I hope you have joined in and felt comfortable. Yes. But we are about to come to a moment that we come to every week here at Wellspring. And I invite you just to join in like you've been doing all morning. But hey, Wellspring, it's time to take our offering. That's right, here we celebrate this moment because we were reminded each and every week that we get to give. It is one of our core values, and it is an overflow of the life of a Christ follower, that we have been given so much, and it is an honor and a privilege to bring back. Yes. And we don't just give back financially. We bring back with our, with our time by serving. Um, we bring back here in the room financially and online. Um, but also, as we approach the Easter season, I'm also reminded that we can give an invite. Yes. Uh, we know that an invite can change a life, and because we have served, because we have given. God has allowed us to invite. We've created this amazing environment. People can find hope and life change here, and God yes. can move in their lives here. And so what an honor to be able to partner with him in that. So as we give back, just also, I just ask you to, um, oh, I almost forgot the most important. Yes, The class participation portion of the service. All right. <laughs> so you will find these invite cards clipped to the seat back in front of you. I want you to take them out and hold them up. I'm yes. going to wait here until I see cards. Hold them up. There you go. These, these little invite cards right here. Uh, oh, We'll get them on the front row. We'll get need them on the front row. Let's hold them up and see them. There we go. Now, I want you to take these and put them in your pocket. There you go. That's easy, wasn't it? Yes. So that'll be the hardest part of our service, I promise. But now, as you put those invites in your pocket, we have been praying over each and every person that you are going to invite and bring to Easter at Wellspring. And I want you to know that as you are going about your business this week, that you would listen for people to say, hey, I bet you would like my church. Would you like to join me for Easter? It yes. is so easy to invite that way. Yes. And so as you have those at the top of your mind, I just would, as the baskets pass to, as the, as the ushers come by. Sorry, I'm still out of breath from that. I know, so, I know. Sorry. No, as the ushers come down and we do take our offering, as the baskets pass, just, I would just ask you to start praying about who you can invite to experience life change this yes. Easter at Wellspring. Absolutely. So as the ushers come down, I'm going to pray for us. I'm praying for our time today. And we can't wait for you to be ready to invite people this week. So why don't you pray with us? God, we just thank you so much for your presence here. We thank you for being in this place. We thank you for every person right now um, who is being obedient in their tithe and giving back to you. We thank you for how you're using these gifts to change lives in Myrtle Beach and in our city. And we ask that you just prompt us this week, God, to invite the people who you are seeking, who you want to know more, and who you love so much. Help us to give that gift of hope and life change this Easter, God. And we just thank you for everything you're going to do over these next few minutes. Speak to our hearts, and we love you so much. Amen feel overwhelmed and underwhelmed with the life you're living? Do you feel stuck, abandoned, maybe even rejected? You probably don't realize it, but you were born with a calling on your life. And God wants to do something amazing through you. Join us as we learn God's plan to turn our struggles into triumph. Overcome. Discover God's path from the desert to your destiny. Thank you. In the middle of a series right now called Overcome. This is week three of our series, and it's really revolved around one main point. So if you're a guest today, here's what we've been talking about. You are destined for greatness, and yes, I mean you. Now, this is week three of the series, so if you want to go back and figure out 
why have you been saying this, how we built this case, I really encourage you at some point to go to this website, wallspringchurch.tv slash overcome and really catch up. I'm going to try to do my best to, to catch you up today, but that's really what it's all about, wallspringchurch.tv slash overcome, because we are dead serious about this point. You are destined for greatness. I know what you're wondering. How do I know? How, how do I know that's true about you? How do I know that's true in your life? And the answer is very simple to me. It may not be convincing to you yet, but, it, but it's very simple to me. And the reason I know that's true is because God says so. And what God says goes. Now again, I, I know that doesn't mean much to you yet, especially if you don't believe in God. One of the things I love about our church is that we have people who attend our church each week that don't even believe in God yet, and you're still checking out God and kicking the tires of faith, and we love that. But see, I know God well, and I've, I've read his book, the, the book he's given to humanity, the Bible. I've read it cover to cover multiple times, and, and I've experienced God in my life, and there is one undeniable truth that comes back over and over and over again to every interaction we have with our Heavenly Father, and it's that He loves you. He loves you. He's crazy about you. He sent His Son on a rescue mission so that He could reconnect with you, so that He could have a relationship with you. He designed you. He created you on purpose. He gave you skills and, and, and strengths and gifts and talents and abilities that he didn't give other people. He gave you a perfectly unique set. He designed you perfectly because he had a role in mind for you in his story from the very beginning. I know this is true about every single person in this room because it's true about every person that's ever existed. Because it's what God wants, and God invites us in to experience that. Now, we choose whether or not we experience it. But I know it's true in your life. I know you're destined for greatness, because God says so. Now, we've been studying the life of a man who feels like many of you. He doesn't believe that. He didn't believe it when God approached him. His name is Moses. And maybe you know the story of Moses. Moses was actually born with a death sentence on his life. He was born into a government that wanted him killed. But God protected him from that. God actually moved him to, 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 be, to, to, to be raised in Pharaoh's home at the age of 40. Uh, Moses loses his temper because he sees something he doesn't like. And uh, we've all lost our temper. But Moses actually killed a guy when he, when he lost his temper. Hopefully, hopefully none of you have killed a guy. If you have, you need to talk to somebody about that. Not me. Uh, but someone, you need to handle, handle that. Please, not me, please. Not me. But Moses commits murder, and he gets caught, and, and he flees Egypt, and he moves to the desert, and he gets married, and he has a family, and at the age of 80, an 80-year-old desert-dwelling murderer, this is when God decides to meet Moses where he is and say, hey, Moses, I have a plan for you to change the world. And for the last two weeks, we've been talking about that story because if an 80-year-old murdering desert dweller can still be used by God, I want you to know you can too. And last week, we actually saw God's invitation to Moses to say, hey, I have a plan for your life. I want to use you to change the world. And through Moses' invitation, I believe God was teaching us some things as well. Specifically, I believe that, that your purpose will require God's presence. Whatever it is God's created you to do in your life, it's going to require his involvement in your life, which makes perfect sense, right? God loves us. He wants to connect with us. And so, of course, whatever he wants us to do in our life is going to require him to be a part of it. I know for some of us, you don't want to take a step for God because it seems overwhelming. It seems, it seems like you're not equipped, like you're not prepared, like you could never do something great for God. And in some respects, you're right. You can't. But that's what God's point is. God says, but we can if you invite me in, you let me participate with you, we, we can go do amazing things. And like Moses, a lot of us want to look at God and say, say, yeah, but we're not ready yet. I don't have what I need yet. I don't know enough. I don't have enough. Um, give me some time and then I'll serve you. That's what Moses said. And God responded with the truth that, well, your purpose will require your possessions, not what you will possess in the future. Moses, you already have everything you need to do what I want you to do. Maybe you remember from last week, Moses actually was holding a shepherd's staff, and God said he threw it on the ground, and it became a snake. He said, pick it up, and it stopped, and it became a staff again. And God said, see, I've equipped you. you, you I'm going to do all these things through you. He basically told to Moses, hey, Moses, you have everything you need to do everything I want you to do, and if you need more, I'll give you more. And that's true for all of us in this room. 
But ultimately what scared Moses was he was afraid he had to go alone. He was afraid that he had to go do this all by himself. And that's what God revealed third last week. He said, your purpose will require other people. See, we're all on the same mission. If we're all going to be used by God to change the world, God's mission is to rescue the world. He just wants us to play our role in it. Moses thought he had to do it alone. For many of us, we get intimidated by serving God because we think we have to serve him alone. We think we're the only people who see this problem, the only person who can take this step. And God's like, no, 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 no. Just like he did with Moses last week, help's already on the way. See, as Moses was complaining about not being able to do things, he didn't know his little brother was, always, was already on the way to help him. God had already orchestrated Aaron coming before Moses even complained. For many of us, we're not doing things because we're afraid God's not going to provide. God's already provided. We just aren't aware of it yet. And so that's where we left it last week. We left Moses sitting in this moment, and I left you sitting in a moment, hopefully thinking the, uh, last week about, about a step you needed to take that was going to require God's presence, that was going to require your possessions, that was going to require other people. That's kind of where I challenged you, what I left you. And I hope you've, you've thought about it, I hope you've prayed about it, maybe even taken some steps, because what we're going to do this week is we're going to drop right back in to Moses' story, because Moses begins to trust God. And he begins to say, okay, I believe you. I'm destined for greatness. I believe you, God. So I'm going to take a step step. And the first step he has to do is get permission to go obey God. Moses was not his own boss. Moses' boss was his father-in-law. So he has to go to his father-in-law Jethro and say, hey Jethro, there was this bush in the uh, middle of the woods. It was on fire. And it was God. And God talked to me. He said, I'm going to go rescue Egypt. And Jethro said, okay. Now I don't know if Jethro just really believed in God or if he thought his son-in-law was crazy. I don't know. But Jethro says, go in peace. You're good. So Moses is like, yes, Baal said I could go. So he starts heading towards Egypt. As he's heading towards Egypt, he runs into his brother Aaron. And he's like, hey, God told me you were coming. And Aaron's like, yeah, God told me to come see you. And so Moses tells Aaron everything God said. And Aaron's like, dude, I'm in. This sounds awesome. Let's go. So Aaron and Moses, they head back to Egypt. And they connect with the, um, the, 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 the nation of Israel, the leaders there. And they go to them and they say, hey, good news. Burning bush, God appeared to us. He wants to rescue you guys. He actually showed us some miracles we can do. Look at this. He did the snake thing. Everybody was like, what? Then he did the thing where he put his hand in his robe and it got sick. And everybody was like, huh? And so they were all super excited. They were like, dude, you are from God. God is going to rescue us. And they get real excited. And everybody's excited. Because God spoke, people are listening, people are obeying, and it's working. Moses is like, you know what? I am destined for greatness. God knew what he was doing with me. So everything's going well. And so then Moses takes the next step. What's the next step? You've got to go before Pharaoh. You've got to go before the king of Egypt. And you got to tell him why you are there. So that's where we're going to pick up today. We're going to pick up in Exodus chapter 5. Exodus is the second book in our Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus. And in chapter 5, we're going to see Moses take his next step in his purpose. And I believe what we see in the life of Moses is going to be reflected in all of our lives as we pursue God with all our hearts. And maybe you're here today and you, you don't pursue God and you haven't pursued God, yet we hope you'll change your mind. After you're here today, you, you might not. But I promise you, it's worth it. So Exodus chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Remember, Moses had success. Father-in-law says yes. Brother says yes. Nation of Israel says yes. Everything's going great. And then this happens. After this presentation to Israel's leaders, that's where he did the snake thing, Moses and Aaron went and spoke to Pharaoh. And they told him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Let my people go so they may hold a festival in my honor in the wilderness. Now, this took a lot of guts because some of you know this. Pharaoh considered himself a god. He was not a human. He was not a mortal. The Egyptians considered their leaders to be a deity. And so they were basically going to a god and saying, the real god says you're not god and you need to let his people go. And so, but again, everything's going great. Everything's working, right? So they go to Pharaoh and they say, hey, we met with God, burning bush, it was really cool. We have some magic tricks we can do. We can turn a stick into a snake, but we're going to hold that. God says, let his people go. Here's Pharaoh's response. Is that so? Really? That's like what you say to your four-year-old. When your four-year-old says, um, Mom, God told me I should drive your car. Is that so? I was a Christian in college, and 
Some of you maybe went to Christian colleges, or maybe you were Christians in, in college or even in high school, and we were like really Christian, like annoying about it, Christian. And one of the God things that kind of came out of that is guys would go up to girls, and they would say, you know, I've been praying. God says we should date. And almost universally, the girl will be like, well, God ain't told me. <laughs> See, that's what Pharaoh does here. Moses and Aaron are like, God told us this. It's going to be great. And Pharaoh's like, I'm sorry, who? What? Is that so? And who is the Lord? And why should I listen to him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord. And I will not let Israel go. No. When Moses and Aaron kind of look at each other and they're like, well, we had the burning bush. He said, come here. And everybody was excited. We came to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said, no. So they kind of, they kind of stammer a little bit and we're told, but, but, but Aaron and Moses, they persisted. They're like, ah, but no, man, but, but the God of Hebrews met with us. And he, he, he said to do this. So let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness so we can offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. They're like, Pharaoh, you don't understand, man. God really said this. Pharaoh doesn't care. Pharaoh thinks he's God. He has no interest in the God of Moses and Aaron. In fact, this makes him angry. And here's how he responds. Pharaoh replied, Moses and Aaron, why are you distracting the people from their tasks? Get back to work. Look, there are many of your people in the land, and you are stopping them from their work. See, Pharaoh has noticed, he's been getting reports that, that the word is spread that Moses and Aaron are there, and these, you know, because the, the, the nation of Israel were slaves in Egypt. They were the workforce. And Pharaoh's getting reports that they're not working hard, and they're kind of talking back because they think they're going to be set free. And this makes Pharaoh very angry because these guys have come in and they have disrupt, disrupted his workforce. So he decides to send a message. Look what Pharaoh does. So the same day, the same day they came in, the same day Pharaoh sent this order to the Egyptian slave drivers and the Israelite foreman. He said, do not supply any more straw for making bricks. Make the people get it themselves. In other words, make their job harder. Straw was, surprised, was supplied for the brick making. Now I was like, you know what? Make them go find their own straw. Don't, don't make it. No, no, no. Make it harder. Make them go find their own straw. Make their job harder. But, watch this. But still require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. In other words, I want to punish them. So let's make their job harder, but expect the same result. Well, we're spreads around the nation of Israel. What are we going to do? We can't, we can't do this. We can't, we, we, we can't make this happen. And so they start talking among themselves, and Pharaoh just stays mad. He just stays mad and starts thinking bad things about the nation of Israel, starts accusing them of things. Look what he says. Look at this. He says, they're lazy. That's why they're crying out, let us go and offer sacrifices to our God. So load them down with more work. Make them sweat. That will teach them to listen to lies. God, what, what is up with this? I mean, think about it. Think about your, your Moses. You're just chilling. And God's like, hey, Moses, I want to use you to change the world. Let's go. He talks you into it. You go. You do what he says. Not only does the person you're talking to say no, but the very people you came to rescue, it makes their lives worse. Now think about the nation of Israel. They're just, you know, minding their own business, hoping God's going to rescue them. Some guy shows up, says he's from God. And it makes their life worse. Well, they don't know about Moses. They don't know about the God stuff. They know they've got to do something about this. And so they get together and they nominate a couple people to go talk to Pharaoh, to try to reason with Pharaoh, to say, hey, hey, this, this is ridiculous. Like, we're doing the best we can. We want to try. We want to do good work for you. But this is ridiculous. You can't make the job harder, and expect us to produce the same amount. We're, we're producing as much as we can. We have to be reasonable about this. And they meet with Pharaoh, and Pharaoh essentially says, not changing my mind, and if you have a problem with that, go talk to Moses, because this is all his fault. And so Moses and Aaron are there at that meeting. They're kind of hanging out outside. And in Exodus 5.20, look at this. 
We're told that as they left Pharaoh's court, these are the people who were nominated to go talk to Pharaoh to try to reason with him. They confronted Moses and Aaron who were waiting outside for them. So Moses and Aaron are waiting outside. These people, they confront them. Here's what they say. Look at this. The foreman, this was the guy who was kind of in, in charge of, of, of the, the nation of Israel and he had gone to try to reason with, Mo, with Pharaoh. The foreman said to them, may the Lord judge and punish you for making a stink before Pharaoh and his officials. You put a sword into their hands, an excuse to kill us. So the nation of Israel turns on Moses, the very person who God has sent to rescue them, because he hasn't made their lives better. He hasn't rescued them. He's made their lives worse. And so Moses doesn't really know what to do. So he does the one thing he can. Look at this. Then Moses went back to the Lord and protested, Why have you brought all this trouble on your own people, Lord? Why did you even send me? God, this wasn't part of the deal. Why is this happening? And he continues, he says, Look, ever since I came to Pharaoh as your spokesman, he has been even more brutal to your people, and you have done nothing. Nothing to rescue them. You've done nothing to help. Now, we have come to a pivotal moment in the life of Moses. And I believe it is a pivotal moment that we will all come to at some point as we attempt to pursue our purpose, as we attempt to pursue what God wants for our life. Because what Moses has run into, and what I've run into from time to time, and what I believe we will all run into in our lives as we pursue our purpose, is pushback. Not everyone will agree. Not everyone will think it's a good idea. It won't always work out perfectly. It won't always work out neatly. It won't always work out nicely. And the question we have to wrestle with, that Moses has to wrestle with, is what do we do with pushback? Have there ever been a moment in your life where you took a step for God? where you felt like you were obeying, you felt like this was the right thing, you had prayed about it, you were like, yes, God, you are with me, you are for me, I'm going to take this step, I'm going to do this, and you stepped, and it didn't work. And you stepped, and other people didn't understand it. And you stepped, and people accused you of things that you weren't doing. Has that ever happened in your life? Because if it has, you have experienced pushback. And if it hasn't, just wait, it's coming. Because pushback is always part of the process of pursuing your purpose. You cannot escape it. No one ever has. And no one ever will. And it's an important part of the process because when we experience the pushback, we want to push away. That's what Moses did. Moses was like, oh, I don't want the pushback. But what we miss, and the reason we're talking about this today, is very simple. Pushback isn't a problem. It's proof that you're pursuing your purpose. And you say, no, Trey, how, how do you know it's proof? Well, it's proof because God told Moses it was going to happen. See, we skipped that part of the story because I think Moses skipped that part of the story. In Exodus 4, before Moses goes back, before he heads back, before he does anything, God sits Moses down, and this is what he tells him in Exodus 4. He says, look, when you arrive back in Egypt, go to Pharaoh, perform all the miracles I've empowered you to do. He says that, yes, you go, I'm going to use you, going to rescue my people, go. But then God adds this, this little line, but I will harden his heart so he will refuse to let the people go. Now, now don't get fixated on the hard, hard, hard in his heart part. God wasn't being mean here. God knew who Pharaoh was. God knew what Pharaoh was going to do. God knows there's an enemy that wants to oppose us and wants to stop us at at every turn. He knows it's going to happen. 
And God has already def- planned a way to defeat it and overcome it. He knew that, God, that, 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 that Pharaoh was going to keep saying no, and it was going to be hard to get Pharaoh to change his mind. So basically, God decided, you know what? I'm going to use this to make a point. But see, he told Moses, hey, Moses, when you go, he's going to say no. He told him. So what does Moses do? Moses gets there and gets upset when Pharaoh says no. And God told him it was going to happen. See, here's what happened to Moses. It was what happened, what happens to me. Maybe not you, but it happens to me in my life. And maybe not you. But, but typically, whenever I feel like God calls me to something big or great, like, for example, when he called me to, to, to move here to start a church, you know, like there's a point in life where you, you hear from God and you take a step for God. And, and then there's a point, it can happen really easily, to where we kind of stop listening to God and we kind of start painting our own picture of what's supposed to happen next You know, and it stops being a story starring God, and it starts being a story starring yourself. And you know, God's called me to do this great thing, and so I'm going to do this great thing for God. You know, and we picture this cinematic picture in our mind where we're the star, and we're the the God people are coming, oh, bless you, sir. You have truly changed the world. Oh, it was nothing. I am but a man destined for greatness. And see, while well, something happened between when Moses left the burning bush and before he got to Pharaoh, something happened. I don't know if it was his father-in-law or if it was his brother or if it was the nation of Israel, but something happened and it got, he got so successful and he began to paint his own picture about what was going to happen. And he began to paint his own picture of success and his own picture of perfection and his own picture of what should be that he forgot. God told him, Moses, Pharaoh was going to say No. It's going to happen. But when Pharaoh walked in, when Moses walked into that moment, his picture had changed. His picture had changed. Not God's, his. He had painted a picture of success that God never planted. You ever done that? You ever hear from God and he says, hey, I want you to go do this. But instead of going to do that, you think of, well, this is going to lead to this, is going to lead to this, is going to lead to this, going to lead to this, going to lead to a new car. <laughs> and then you don't get the new car. And God's like, I never said new car. In fact, I told you it was coming. I told you there will be pushback. He told Moses, hey, Moses, pushback isn't a problem. It's proof that you're pursuing your purpose. And Moses, your purpose is my purpose. And my ways are higher. My ways are different. My ways don't always make sense to you. But I know what I'm doing. And I've invited you to join me. And the quicker you can remember it's my picture and my party and not yours, the better life will be. Because if you know the rest of the story, God wins. But Moses has to go back again and again and again and again, month after month. Hey, will you let God's people go? Nope. Hey, how, how about now? And Pharaoh will say, okay, yes, take them. And so they'll start to pack up, and Pharaoh will be like, nope, change my mind, I can't go. And then next week, as we're going to see, eventually, God's will is done. And he is set free. But not without some pushback. And every step of the way, God will say, hey, you're going to go today. He's going to say no. But don't forget, I'm in charge. And eventually, Moses began to learn that process. Moses began to see pushback not as a problem, but as proof that he was pursuing his purpose. Please hear me today. Every man, woman, child in this room, if you decide to pursue the purpose for which you were created, you will, not maybe, not sort of, you will encounter pushback. It is coming. Because just like God told Moses, Pharaoh's going to say no. When Jesus was on the earth, He talked directly to us, and he said, hey, I love you. I have a great plan for your life. I want you to join me to change the world. It's going to make everything better. But hey, just don't don't, don't miss this part. Not everybody's going to like it. Not everybody's going to agree. Again, because we have an enemy, Satan, who hates our guts, and he's always trying to outfox God. And, And really, from our perspective, it's like, remember the old Roadrunner cartoons? 
Remember the Roadrunner cartoons and how Kali, Wally Coyote always thought he had the Roadrunner. He always thought it, and he never did. That's God and Satan. Seriously. So every time Satan's like, oh, I got him this time. And God's like, me, me. And never <laughs> once. Never once. But that's what the pushback is. The pushback is our enemy thinking, oh, I got him this time. And God's there going, no, you don't. No, in fact, I'm going to use this to make them better. But what did Jesus tell us? How did Jesus say it was coming? Uh, let, me, let, me, let me turn to it real quick. In, in, in the New Testament, the book of Matthew records one of Jesus' most famous sermons, and here's what he says. Here's what he says. He says, hey, God blesses you. God equips you. God prepares you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. And look at this. It says when. Doesn't say if. Doesn't say might. It says, hey, it's coming. Because we have an enemy. And he hates our guts. And he wants to stop us. And he wants to thwart what we're doing. And so I'm just preparing you in advance. Before you walk in, before you do anything, I need you to know, if you're going to pursue your purpose, there will be pushback. There will be roadblocks. There will be things you do not understand. And when you encounter them, please remember, pushback isn't a problem. It's proof you're pursuing your purpose. It was proof for Moses, and it's proof for you. Now, very quickly, let me distinguish. I'm talking about pushback. I'm not talking about the consequence of sin. Okay, pushback is what happens when you're pursuing your purpose and out of left field people are coming and stopping it. If you're just sinning left and right and that's causing you not to have some things, Jesus can fix that, but that ain't pushback. That ain't proof of anything. I want somebody leaving here today doing something crazy and people are like, oh, that's wrong, you're a lunatic. And you're like, oh, quit pushing me back. They're like, I ain't pushing you back, dude. You insane. There's a difference. But pushback is a part of the process. So what do we do when there's pushback? This is where we can learn from Moses. Moses actually does the right thing. Moses goes to his heavenly father. Moses goes to his heavenly father and says, dude, what are you doing? What's happening? And God's able to say, I told you this was going to happen. It's okay. It's good. I got your back. And some of you are thinking, I can't tell God that I'm mad at him. Of course you can. He knows. Not only does he know, I believe he's given us permission. Go read the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is a recording of prayers. It's near the end of the Old Testament. It sits right in the middle of the Bible. And a lot of those prayers are written by a guy named David. David was a king of, of, of Israel, loved God with all his heart, but sometimes he'd get pretty angry at God. And there are literally Psalms written in the Bible that are nothing but David yelling at God. God, I don't understand why you did this. God, I don't trust you. God, I don't believe in you. God, I thought you were better than this. And not one time does God say, what now? God's a big God. He can take it. Because what happens is when you go to your Heavenly Father, when you talk to Him about that, He's able to say, come on. We've talked about this. I told you it was going to happen. And I told you we'd win. So I know it's, it's no fun that this is happening right now. But trust me, because I know what I'm doing. And the more you go back to God, and the more you talk to him about it, and the more you read his word, and you see how so many people struggle with pushback, the more you're able to begin to understand, okay, yeah, this isn't a problem. This is proof. Okay, like for example, our church, Wellspring, tons of pushback. Tons of pushback. Some of you don't know this story. Did you know that in September of 2009, we were supposed to launch. We had a grand opening planned. We had flyers that we had handed out. And we never met in that location. Because two weeks prior to grand opening, they accused us of being liars. They accused us of stealing. And they kicked us out. Two weeks prior to grand opening. Two weeks prior to what in our brain was going to be the beginning of everything homeless two weeks prior to grand opening. Now, I won't tell you where that was. I won't tell you where we're going to be. I will tell you it no longer exists. But I won't tell you where it was. But it no longer exists. I won't tell you, but it's not there anymore. But so two weeks prior, we had to go find a place. We started in the, uh, in the uh, movie theaters there at Broadway at the beach. 
And man, we grinded it out. We just, we just started having church. And just to give you a picture, this section of this service, right? Just this section. If y'all had all showed up at one time at the movie theater, we'd have called it a revival. <laughs> Hallelujah. I mean, we'd have flipped out. And we grinded it out, man. And we were just like, okay, I, I don't know what's going on. But we're going to learn. We're going to do this thing. So then we, we actually, we, we prayed and we decided to move to Myrtle Beach Middle School, which some of you actually were attended in Myrtle Beach Middle School. And that's kind of where we started to figure out who we were. You know, everything got better. The music got better. Our kids' ministry got better. And we were like, okay, this is actually starting to work. We started to grow a little bit. We're like, all right, all right, here we go. I started thinking, all right, God. I started writing my picture. Oh, God, we're going to fill up this middle school. Oh, it's going to be great. About a year, year and a half in, the entire staff were out of town at an event. Eric gets an email. Face goes white. Looks at us and says, the middle school wants us out. Now pushback. Well, now what? Now we're homeless again. So we start praying. At the time, TJ and I were both working out at the YMCA, but I'd never, it had never occurred to me to have church there. First day I walked in asking God, okay, God, what's next? He begins to open my eyes to the advantages of meeting there, what we could do in the auditorium, I mean, what we could do in the gym and our, our children's environments and how, how much better they could be. And so we, we talked to them, and they, they said yes. And so we moved in. We were there for a couple of years. And, and you guys know, that, that's really where Wellspring became Wellspring. Um, many of you attended there. And that's where God was able to grow us enough to make this move. And this move, trust me, can't get into it right now, but lots of pushback. Lots of pushback. But what's happened to me in my life, and what I believe is the reason that, that, that this story is in, is in the Bible and that why God wants to do this, is I began to notice that, that this pushback, even though Satan thought he was using it to stop us, Satan was like, ha, look what I can do. Ha, look what I can do. Every single time, God was like, no, 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 there's purpose of this pushback. I can, I, I can make it better. I can make this better, but just, just push through. Just follow me. Just trust me. And you say, what possible purpose could there be in pushback, what possible purpose could there be in failures? What possible purpose could there be in things not working out? And to answer that question, I want to turn to Jesus' little brother, a guy named James. After Jesus dies and comes back to life, James' life is radically transformed. He becomes a leader in the early church. For those of you who are skeptic about the faith, I just ask you this question. What would your big brother have to do for you to tell the entire world he was right about everything? He'd probably have to die and come back to life, right? That's about it. Well, that's what James did. James spent the rest of his life saying, my big brother was right about everything. And in his letter to a group of Christians to kind of help them know how to follow God, he, he dives straight into pushback. He drives straight, in, straight into when we're following God and things don't work out. And he says, there's a purpose to the pushback. Here's what he says in James 1. He says, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles, when pushback, when things you don't understand, when that of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. In other words, when you feel the pushback, when things don't go right, when there's an obstacle, what James says is get excited. Consider it an opportunity for great joy. Like high five about it. Like call your friends, put it on Facebook, text people. Things are terrible. Hashtag great joy. Now, why? Why would you do that? Why, why would you do that? This is what James says. He says, look. He says, for you know that when your faith is tested. See, faith, that's really what's tested during pushback, right? It's your faith. Because you're like, God, I heard you. God, I thought you said to do this. And things aren't working out like I thought they would. So do I still believe you are who you say you are, God? Do I have faith? Do I still believe I am who you say I am, God? Do I have faith? Do I have faith that these circumstances can be overcome? Or, or am I going to stop trusting you, God? Am I going to stop trusting in this moment? What James is saying is every single time that you have an opportunity to have your faith tested. He says that's an opportunity for great joy. Why? Because when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Your strength grows. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, 
you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. See, here's what he's saying. He's saying every time you have an opportunity to, to, to push through something, anytime you have an opportunity where you have to really trust me and you have to believe me, he's like, take that, hold that, hold, uh, follow that, push through that. Because every time you push, you're stretching and you're growing and your faith is deepening and you're learning to trust me more and you're learning to believe me more and your life's going to be better because of it. See, our enemy thinks he's stopping you from pursuing your purpose. That's why he sends pushback. Our God is so great that even that garbage, even the stuff thrown at us, God's like, I got it. I have a purpose for it. And you know what the purpose is? The purpose of pushback is perfection. You say, that's the very thing I'm going to use to grow your faith. That's the very thing I'm going to use to strengthen those muscles. Because you know, you don't grow muscles unless there's resistance, unless there's pushback. We've all been in the gym and seen the person who's just been lifting the bar for a year, right? They're not getting any stronger. That's fine. They're exercising, whatever. But they're not getting any stronger. Their muscles aren't getting any bigger. If you want to get stronger and bigger, you have to increase the pressure. You have to increase the rate. The weight. You have to increase the resistance. And as you push against that res resistance, and as you pull against that resistance, your muscles are stretched, and they grow. May I offer to you today, that's what pushback is in your life. Pushback isn't an obstacle. Pushback is an opportunity to grow your faith. And the heavier the pushback, the harder you have to push, and the more your faith grows. Because when I say pushback is the, the purpose of pushback is perfection, I don't mean you're going to be perfect because, of course, you're never going to be perfect. I'm never going to be perfect this side of heaven. Perfection is not an option for us. And I don't think God is asking us to have perfect obedience, perfect wisdom. I think there's one thing he's trying to perfect through pushback. That's our faith. He's trying to give us perfect faith. He's trying to strengthen us and prepare us so that we can walk into the next thing. We can walk into the next, push, next pushback knowing, knowing no matter what happens, no matter what comes my way, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to say, you know what? My God was good before. My God got me through it before. And my God's going to get me through this again because he has never let me down and he never will. And folks, I'll tell you right now, there is no telling what God could do with a church full of people who have decided to push through the pushback, who have decided to say, you know what? The purpose of pushback is perfection. My Heavenly Father has never let me down. My Heavenly Father will never let me down. So no matter what comes my way, no matter who says what, no matter what happens, I'm standing right here and I'm moving forward because that's the way Jesus says to go and I'm not turning anywhere else. Man, I love God so much. He takes the very obstacles the enemy puts in front of us and he makes them the monuments of our greatest victories. So as you pursue your purpose, as you run into those moments, remember, pushback isn't a problem. It's proof that you're pursuing your purpose. So where in your life are you experiencing pushback? What is the step you know you should take? What is the step you want to take? What is the step in your soul you need to take but you haven't because something is pushing back on your life? Something is telling you this is not for you. Something is telling you this will never work. Something is telling you you don't deserve this. Something is telling you you are disqualified for this. God could never use you. God doesn't want you. This will never happen. That pushback in your life is the pivotal moment of your faith. And as you take God's hand and say, you know what, I'm going to trust God and I'm going to walk through it. As you push through the pushback, your faith will strengthen. Your love for God will grow. Your resolve for the future will be strengthened. And there is no telling what God can do in you and through you. So I don't know what the step is. I have no idea, but I know you do. What's the step? Where's God? Where is where, where do you have pushback in your life as you pursue God? It's not a problem. 
It's proof. And as you walk through that pushback, as you get to the other side, you'll understand that the purpose of pushback is perfection. Not your behaviors, but your faith. A perfect faith in your Heavenly Father. So as we close today, we're going to close with a song that, that to me, I, I, my prayer is that you don't just sing it. My prayer is that this song seals this message in your heart. Because in the song, one of the lines says, I've seen you move. I've seen you move the mountains. And I believe that I'll see you do it again. That is the purpose of pushback. That is the perfection that he offers. God, I've read your stories. God, I've seen you do things. I know you can break these chains. I know you can overcome it because you already have before. I've seen you do it before. I don't know how you're going to do it now, but boy, I can't wait to see it. Because I'm telling you, what's on the other side of that obstacle? What's on the other side of that pushback? What's on the other side of that trial? Is the very reason you were created. The reason you are who you are. So today my prayer for you is that you will have the strength, you will have the courage, and that God will give you the faith to push through the pushback. To pursue your purpose. And to receive the perfection of faith that he's orchestrating right now. Because remember from last week, as like Aaron taught us, help's already on the way. So push through. And let God perfect your faith. Let me pray. God, we love you so much. Father, we thank you for just the clarity of your word and the clarity of your truth. We thank you for your servant Moses who was so willing to just share all his flaws and all his failures, Father. Thank you that we can relate to him. Thank you that you saved us and that you have better for us. Give us strength, give us courage, give us faith to push through the pushback, to receive the perfection you offer, and to walk into the purpose you created us to live. So in your name we pray. Amen. change to come and knowing the battles won for you have never failed me yet the promise still stands great is your faith i
heart will sing your praise again. The promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence.